What's going on, trail runners? Welcome to another episode of the Coop Cast. As always, I am your host, Jason Coop, and the summer is here. It is heating up, trails everywhere, people are getting out, the sun is a shining, and every single year I see athletes make the same mistake again and again once the temperatures start to rise, and that is they fail to hydrate properly. They either go out on their standard run with the same amount of fluid that they uh, were used to during the winter times. They run out of fluid in the middle of the run, they come back parched, or they don't even start the run with any fluid at all, thinking they can kind of get away with it. And normally, that mistake happens one, two, three, maybe four times before the athlete finally learns and, and thinks, okay, I've got to take more fluid on the run with me. But that doesn't necessarily need to happen. We can be smarter than that. And so on the podcast today, I brought on none other than Stavros Kavaras, who is a researcher at Arizona State University. He is otherwise known as Dr. Hydration. And as that moniker would indicate, his expertise is in hydration and fluid balance, where he has been the author of more than 130 peer-reviewed articles, many of which have to do with performance, hydration, and fluid balance. And we've all heard conflicting advice on this in the past. Personally, I remember standing at the start of the Wasatch 100 one year and having the medical director, the race director, tell the entire group there that you cannot drink enough. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You cannot, you cannot drink too much. Do whatever you can do to hydrate. The very next year, I remember standing at the uh, pre-race briefing for the Leadville Trail 100 and and having their medical director tell me to drink to thirst. And these two pieces of advice we have all heard as trail runners, and they can, can and they can come into conflict with each other. And so I used a little bit of that dialogue alongside of some of the recent American College of Sports Medicine position papers to kind of paint this picture of hydration and why it is so confounding from a performance standpoint to ultra runners. This episode is chock full of a lot of practical information that you can take out on the trails with you tomorrow. And I hope it does clear up some of the confusion around how much to hydrate, when to hydrate, different variables that affect hydration, and how you can dial in how much fluid you need to take in during your next ultra marathon. I really appreciate appreciate Stavros coming on the podcast today. As you can tell, he is an he is an endurance aficionado. We talk a lot a, a lot about uh, some of his early days being a professor and going out to the Spartathlon and uh, watching the event from an aid station there. And what a be- what you know what a better place to study heat and hydration than that particular ultra marathon. It is a really hot and a really hard uh, really hard race. We had a lot of fun with this one, you guys. And like I said, I hope that everybody gets a little bit of information out of this that they can take out on all of your summer adventures. So you stay healthy, stay happy, and you just have fun on the trails, people. So here we go. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Stavros Kavaros, all about hydration. all the other papers interestingly enough the proton pump and inhib- uh inhibitor one that you sent me over i've used that protocol myself and with my athletes before a lot yeah and for what for what so, it's worth so the, i notice it makes a difference the first author actually uh marcus talman is a great ultra guy and he he won the spartathlon one year mm-hmm. uh he's about I don't know if you're familiar with Spartathlon. Yeah, He's oh, a yeah. 24 hour runner. Yeah. Uh, I worked for Spartathlon for 10 years. I was a volunteer in one of the biggest checkpoints in Ancient Corinth. And I loved it. I haven't, I mean, I haven't been doing that since 2012 that I moved back in the US. So, but it's like, it has a very dear place in my heart and our entire family used to go there and volunteer, used to bring like a whole bunch of students from my lab 
it was like friends and and it became like a friends and family (laughs) our checkpoint we were like 30 people we had we were the only checkpoint that we had ice oh oh my god runners and they will stop by they will see ice so they will be like they will get on my they will get on my legs they'll be like i love you i love you i love you (laughs) it will be like 95 degrees they'll be running for like i don't know 50 miles already and they will stop by and they will find ice and they will take it and rub their back yeah. of their head, rub their knees and they'll be like, oh my God, that's great. <laughs> well, I'm sure, first off, Spartathlon is brutal. I mean, that race is br- <laughs> is like the quintessential brutal of the brutal ultramarathons. In a lot of ways, it's more brutal than Badwater because the um, the environment with all like the slow moving traffic around there just it, it just makes it feel hotter, and you're sucking in all those noxious noxious fumes and whatnot. The, the beginning, the first part of the probably the one third of the race, it goes through the city, yeah, and it goes through a not very pretty, very industrial yeah. area yeah. actually, which is n- not the good part of Athens to be, you know. <laughs> Uh, but there is no other way to leave from the city going towards Corinth yeah. and then down to yeah. Peloponnese to go to Sparta. Yeah. That's that's the way. Yeah. It's and a- it's all asphalt during the day, so you get all the heat wave of day one, and then you go through the mountains at night where the temperature occasionally might be as low as close to freezing, mm-hmm. maybe not freezing, but like mid-40s maybe. And then next morning... For the people that they don't finish within 26 hours, they get the second day heat. Yeah. So it's like... <laughs> it's so brutal. As a hydration researcher, when you went out to those things and you were, you know, manning an aid station with your family, do, were you like, did you have like your research hat and your aid station hat on at the same time and just like look at this? Or are you like a kid in a candy store at those things? Uh, it was It was a little bit like this, especially with, you know, it's... You teach all that stuff in the classroom, you talk about it, you experiment things, but when you see things anyway, I can share some of my experience from Spartathlon through the podcast. I can give you some examples. Like you see things. I remember one day, actually, this is a great story. I'm sitting in, um, um, we used to do almost every year the the major checkpoint, which is in Ancient Corinth, right across the street from the archeological site. Um, so there is this Japanese lady, she must, she was probably mid sixties, maybe she comes over and she has all the classic symptoms of a heat stroke. So I am there with my students and I'm teaching pretty much. I'm like, so she got this that we talk in the classroom. (laughs) She got this, she got this. So there is no way she's going to go on. She's going to drop either here now. Or in the next checkpoint, she's, she's either has, she will either quit or kind of collapse. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, that person rested, ate, drank, you know, a little bit. And then next thing you know, she keeps running and she keeps running through the next checkpoint, the next and the next. And she ended up finishing in like top three, top four women, probably. Wow. That's really it's amazing. Like you Holy see cow. people that come back from death. Like you see them and they're like, they will either die or... Well, or crumpings, yeah. crumping that I've seen in Spartathlon, I have never seen in my entire life, like whole body cramping from your cuffs to your stomach, to your pecs, to your hands, like, like a wave going up and down. And you're like, you're, there is nothing you can do. There is somebody on the ground laying and, and screaming and there is nothing you can do. You cannot touch them. You touch them in one hand, you know, they get a cramp because you move their arm a certain way. That's exactly and correct. And you're like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of those runners will finish, like despite how terrible some, you see them. them. And, and that rate, that aid station, as you mentioned, is early in the race. Like yeah. usually when, when ultramarathon athletes have those types of problems that early, you could very easily like diagnose that as, oh, that person is for sure going to DNF. But for whatever reason, like if they if they get their act together and they're reasonably fit, they're not pushing cutoffs or anything like that, they can still go and finish the race. 
So there's your other lesson to your students, right? It's not just yep. the clinical presentation yep. of, yep. Yep. of yep. you know, being overheated or hyponatremia, not hyponatremia or anything like that. It's also, hey, the fact they can, you know, pick themselves up and finish. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's since we're on that, we weren't planning on starting on 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 Spartathlon, but since we're already talking about it, we might as well. One of the one of the reasons it's such an interesting playground is because you did some research out there that showed an incredibly, in fact, if if I'm not mistaken, it was the highest rate of hyponatremia that's been demonstrated in the literature. Why don't you give like an overview of that uh, of that research and what you guys found? Um, yeah, these are data actually that we collected over the course of two years. So uh, in the first year, we wanted to examine primarily the frequency of uh, hyponatremia in ultra running and something of that long, which is like the main finishing time was around 30 hours. So a Spartathlon is 246 kilometers, like about 162 miles, if I remember correct by heart. Um, so you're supposed to finish within 36 hours. So the, the sheer volume and the length of that race and the duration of this race, it's a, a good candidate to become hyponatremic. So, uh, so the first year we, we uh, just assessed hyponatremia. We took blood samples before and blood samples after. So looking at hyponatremia, we were looking primarily what is the, the percent of runners that they will have plasma sodium, which is uh, below what is a normal value. 135 is the normal value. And below 130, you typically call it uh, severe hyponatremia or more serious hyponatremia where you typically start seeing symptoms associated with uh, decrease in plasma sodium. Uh, So the incidence that we found at the beginning, it was crazy, was something like 50 something, 60% or more of them, they were like meeting more than the the 135 limit. And then the second year we came back and uh, we took a blood sample before and we managed to take some blood samples right um, in, in ancient Corinth, actually, which is, um, it's approximately uh, about 60 miles. Is I think it's right before 90 kilometer checkpoint. Uh, so they have run already two marathons in the heat. Um, so there were two observations that they were very interesting. So number one, um, about 10% of the runners, they show up in the, in the starting line with plasma sodium below normal. 10%. So they were starting the race hyponatremic. And those people, obviously, it was a very, very mild degree of hyponatremia, but there were people that they were not aware that they were in that situation, obviously. Uh, the second interesting part is that we had several people that they had already uh, severe hyponatremia by the... Uh, and St. Corinth checkpoint, so by kilometer 90, they had already developed hyponatremia with plasma sodium levels below 130, and, and some of those people were able to finish. So all the data that we reported in the study, those were data of finishers only. So we did not include anybody that we took baseline blood samples, and those people did not manage to finish the race. And the reason we did that, because... Uh, logistically speaking, this is a very complicated race. Uh, it gets very long after a certain point. There are people that they have proceeded through several checkpoints. People are on the back, and and it it's you, depends on where you don't when you quit the race. You can get picked up and taken back to Athens, or if you are farther in the race, they might pick you up and take you down to Sparta. So it's very difficult to identify those people. Take blood samples right on the spot. And literally with 70 something checkpoints and, and a span of dozens of hours from the beginning to the end, pretty much, uh, it would take like an army of, of scientists to be able to uh, do this kind of control and potentially having, I don't know, motorcycles running next to them up to a point because, you know, yeah, yeah. when they go through uh, one of the climbs, you can you barely walk or crawl there to make it yeah. to the top. Um, we published another study a few years ago, actually back in must have been 2006 or seven, if I remember correct, where we reported muscle damage and uh, pretty much what we call um, 
um, exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. So we were measuring one of the indices that we assess, rhabdo, and the values that we had, the main value of the finishers was above the value that any medical doctor would have hospitalized anybody. So just to give you an idea, we had people in the hundreds, 100, 120, thousand international units of CPK, which is the creatine phosphokinase enzyme that leaks from the muscle fibers in the circulation in the blood. Uh, when the, the normal value for a normal human being is below 200, uh, the mean value was around 40,000 units. So anybody with this kind of, of evidence uh, in, a, in a biochemical analysis, we have been taken to the hospital to be treated from rhabdomyolysis. What is interesting is that you talk to these runners and they know about it. So they are aware of this is what happens when you participate in a race like that. And their answer is simple. They say, we know about it. We rest the next few days. <laughs> There's not much you can do. And we drink a lot of water to save our kidneys. So we try to drink a lot and pee dilute urine for the next few days and clear out those big proteins out of the kidney. Uh, the, 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 the kidney stress must be absolutely crazy. I remember the, the first year we did the, the very first data collection. We took the blood samples in the lab and we tried to analyze them. And uh, we use one of this assay, we call it colorometric. So we measure color. So it's supposed to turn into a little light purplish color. So we run the first samples. The samples turn out black immediately. I'm like, what happened? We're like, how about if they were very concentrated in this molecule we're trying to measure? And we kept doing serial dilutions over and over and over. We ended up diluting the sample how many times to be able to measure what we wanted to measure because it was, you know, th those uh, biomedical diagnostic kits are not developed right. for people that they have 100,000 units. <laughs> They're developed to measure from 200 to 800. Yeah, normally 100,000 units they're talking about people going into the ER for a heart attack or, or a car accident or something like that. And it's always been crazy to me when I see those studies and it's, and we, we see those studies a lot in ultra running where people do get 40,000 units, 50,000 units, 80,000 units, a hundred thousand units. And I've always been, a, I've always been kind of amazed at the variability and the fact that it doesn't seem to be linked to finishing time. Like you see people that finish really fast that have, super high values and very low values. And you f see people that are that are chasing the cutoffs that also have super high values and very low values. But it's, uh, it, I, I agree with you. Ultra marathon running is a really good um, case study for a lot of things because of the, the physicality of the events, right? It's such a physical event and people are pushing themselves to the limit. And I'm actually really appreciative of a lot of the research that's now been done in that space. Because when I first started working with ultra runners, like in the early 2000s, there was hardly any research on any of this at all. And now to see all of this come out over like the last, you know, 15 or 20 years, it, it, it helped. It just helps my, my, my coaching practice a lot, but we could go that I, I do want to come back to the hyponatremia thing because it's, it's something that I think that we don't have a very good fix on in the running space and the coaching space and maybe even from the from the research space but i think even before that hydration which is your gig as a whole just for health is something that we don't really have a good fix on either and the 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 way that i the way that i really illustrate that is, is i was doing some research for this in advance and i just pulled up the usda guidelines on how much vitamin C do we need and how many apples a day do I need to eat and all that other stuff. And the, the USDA guidelines that roll every five years, it's like a 120, 140 page document. It doesn't mention a water recommendation ever in the whole thing. The only recommendation or the only, the only references to water are the water content in food and how to wash your hands or that you should wash your hands. Are we getting it wrong from the get go at that like really basic level? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
and and it's not anybody's uh, bad intention. So nobody is trying to uh, work against the water or thinks that water is not important. You know, every single human being would agree that without water you cannot make it. It's absolutely essential for survival. Yes, we can produce a tiny, tiny amount through metabolism, but most of the water that we need, we take it through drinking. So uh, the strongest evidence is uh, my plate, the, uh, the, the, the um, diagram of, of a, a plate with you know, portions of what type of food you're supposed to have and what to pay attention when you eat. Uh, does not include water. I got excited when it came out a few years ago because I thought that circle on the top right, it was water and it said, <laughs> it says dairy. It's a blue circle, actually, that I don't know what is a blue dairy, probably oh, blueberry no. yogurt. Um, but uh, definitely it's not water. There is a big move and uh, I'm optimistic that in the next cycle of the dietary guidelines, we will have a new version of my plate that uh, there will be water there. There are some pyramids around the world actually, because I've been um, uh, traveling a lot, not nowadays with the COVID-19, but, um, and I give a lot of lectures around the world talking about hydration and uh, dietary guidelines. I was involved with the development of the Chinese guidelines uh, a few years ago. They do have water. Um, uh, in France, there is water. In Indonesia, there is water. So many countries around the world, they do have water in the dietary guidelines. Some of them, they still have the pyramid. Uh, one interesting exercise that I actually, when I speak about hydration, I like to do this exercise in, in my slides. Um, if you go to the dietary guidelines, and uh, I think it's called healthy eating... Um, no, it's not healthy eating. It's it's uh, dietary 2020, 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, this document that you mentioned earlier, it's available there online, and you can go and search. And you know what I did? I went to the box and I put the word water, enter, and I got four things. One of them is a definition of what is a calorie. Number two and number three is the importance of replacing sugary drinks with plain water to avoid obesity, diabetes, dental disease, and on and on and on. And the fourth one is, as you mentioned, wash your hands with soapy water. So, so these are the four mentions for water. So the, the long story short in this conversation is nobody has a malintention against water. The truth is that we still lack of a lot of research and a lot of information to identify what is the impact of drinking adequate amount of water on health. So there is a lot of data on hydration and exercise performance and myself um, and, and many other colleagues have done a lot of work in this area, but there is relatively very little being done in hydration and health. And, and just to give you a strong example about it, um, many people have heard the, the classic advice for uh, people that they get urinary tract infection, which is something more common in women, they say one of the easy things you can do, drink more water and by flushing your kidney and urinating more often, that decreases uh, recurrence of UTI. So the first randomized control trial, it was published last year. Wow. There is no other wow. evidence of that. So that huh. was a good advice. Huh. Nobody had a, a bad intention, but this is the first time that something was scientifically proven and supported that it's good for you. Wow. So to give, so in the U.S., one could assume that water's not important because it's not in the dietary guidelines. Obviously, we know it is. And maybe you'll get your shot next year because these guidelines run every five years and we're in the last year of that cycle being 2020. But why don't you give the, lesson, the listeners a little bit of perspective of what those hydration guidelines look like in other countries. And then we're going to move into the sport and performance area, which a lot of the listeners are going to be interested in uh, kind of the most here. Um, I, I can spend pro probably two days talking about the differences <laughs> and why they're different between countries. Yeah. So like in, in Europe, there are about 30% lower than they are in the U.S. We do have actually dietary guidelines in the U.S. Uh, the Institute of Medicine that publishes all the dietary references for all the nutrients, 
In 2004, for first time, they published the dietary guidelines for water. Uh, those numbers are published in liters. So for adult males, it's 3.7 liters of water per day. For females, it's 2.7 liters per day. So to make it more relevant, especially for people that they are not good with volumes in liters and ml and ounces, etc., uh, if we correct, because this is the total amount of water that we also take by eating bread, rice, pasta, uh, fruits, vegetables, etc., if we do the correction that at least the 20% of the water comes from solid food, um, and we translate that volume into glasses of water, and we take the a small glass of water, eight ounces, which is a standard, maybe in the U.S. is not the standard anymore, but uh, if we translate it into eight ounces um, glasses size, for males, this is equivalent for 12 glasses per day, and for females, is eight glasses per day. So this is the practical advice. This is what I can say today based on what we have. Uh, in Europe, these numbers are slightly smaller. There are about 2.5 liters for males and 2.2 liters for females. Um, why they're different? We don't have good methodologies to assess water intake. We don't have good biomarkers. So there are a lot of reasons. But um, just to close the, the topic of uh, why water hasn't been studied that, effect, that um, extensively like other nutrients um, is um, I think number one, it's a little bit forgotten, uh, forgotten because it doesn't come with calories. It doesn't come with guilt. Even if you ask people how much water you had yesterday, probably you have to think very carefully and go through the day trying to remember how much water you had because you don't think of it when you drink water. Versus if I ask you, I don't know how many beers you had over the weekend, you will probably remember, you know. Uh, so, so guilt association is something that makes things, you know, easier or, um, or not. So and, and on the other side, um, it's, it's something that um, water comes from the top. You know, you turn on the top, you have water. That's it. And in um, most places... Uh, in most countries and in most cities in the U.S., the water is relatively safe and, and good and you don't have to pay for it. So the initiative of funding studies on plain water has been very, very limited. I almost think that now that LaCroix and all these seltzer waters are becoming the it drinks, that those might actually be more likely to get funded than plain water. Like they're going to study seltzer water and maybe the guidelines are based off of those studies versus with plain water because that's where the money is. Uh, it's true. And if you pay attention, actually, uh, now the the beer companies are getting into that. That's market. right. Uh -huh. uh, LaCroix was one of the first ones that they started making bubbly water in the mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, the bubbly water, I think it's Pepsi, if I remember correct. Uh, there are many companies that they do that. Pepsi bought recently the Soda Stream, which is a machine that you can create your own sparkling water at home. Uh, Americans traditionally ha are not uh, big consumers of sparkling water, actually. Uh, it used to be more of a European fashion, and ma mainly Central and Northern Europeans used to drink predominantly uh, uh, sparkling water, but now it's catching up in the U.S. And I think it's a good alternative for people that they're trying to get uh, unhooked from soft drinks and they still like something different than yeah. water. They like the carbonation. This is a, a good way to do it. Yep. I think it's a good substitute. Okay. Needless to say, drink your water, even if you can't find out exactly what the right amount is three, four, maybe five liters a day might be more for athletes. And we're going to get into some of those specific recommendations. So as confounding as just day-to-day -day hydration guidelines can be, it's different for whatever reason all over the world. In the U.S., it can be hard to, to come by. In a sports performance setting, it can be confounding as well. And You've been in the research field for a while, and I've been in the I've been in coaching for a while, and we've both seen the recommendations change, and we've also seen athletes' attitudes uh, change on this as well. And this is really no better illustrated than the ACSM's guidelines. So the ACSM puts out guidelines for a lot of things every year, and one of the things they put out is is how you should how you should hydrate, and. 
I had to pull this up beforehand, and I'm going to kind of read it verbatim just to set the stage on this. In 1996, their guideline was, quote, as, as Stavros starts to pour his water into his cup over there right on cue, <laughs> during exercise, athletes should start drinking early and at regular intervals and attempt to consume fluids at a rate sufficient to replace all of the water loss through sweating or – this is my emphasis, or consume the maximal amount that can be tolerated. And the emphasis on the last part is kind of what I was trying to drive home. Go ahead. Can you continue the reading a little bit? Read the sentence right after that? Oh, I didn't pull I didn't pull it. I didn't pull it up. What is it? Without drinking beyond your sweat losses. There you go. Without drinking beyond your sweat. This is something that people um, that are accusing this guidelines forget to read. Uh, but it's but the reason it's confounding is because it's conflicting in those two sides of the statement, right? So, so let me tell you my uh, interpretation of the, the there is what is called the letter of the law and the <laughs> and the spirit, spirit of, of the law. law. <laughs> so, so let me give you a little bit of a background where this statement comes from. So, it comes from a fact, and the fact is that we are human beings programmed to drink less than what we lose via sweating during exercise. So even myself, that I am a hydration scientist, this is what I do for a living. I think of it every single day. Uh, I When I go out to exercise, and even now, you know, that it's, it's already hot here in Phoenix, Arizona, when I go out, I, I cycle usually early in the morning. Um, I almost every time I do this exercise, I get my nude body weight before I leave, nude body weight as soon as I come back. And I see, even though I'm drinking how much, I, what kind of deficit I have, I'm always on a deficit for going out for just one hour bike ride. You know, I don't have more time in the morning to exercise before work. Uh, so I know what to do. I have convinced myself that this is, it's good for me to try to keep up with that. So what I'm trying to say is this, that the spirit of that as much as possible says, it, it refers to the fact that even if you cannot keep up with your sweat rate, try to drink as much as possible. Okay. So let's say, um, like back in 1996, one of the interesting case study that was published that by one of the co-authors in that paper, uh, Larry Armstrong, um, he published a, a, a well-known article about Alberto Salazar when he was preparing for, for the 1984 Olympic Games. And Alberto had a sweat rate for uh, of approximately one gallon of sweat per hour. Yeah, it's impossible so, to keep up with. Like, how can you keep up yeah, with this? Impossible. So what would you say to this guy? Drink as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. This is the guideline. Nobody can drink a gallon per hour, you know. <laughs> and nobody insane mind will recommend to any human being drink a gallon right. per hour. Right. So the, the maximum ability of your GI system to absorb, it's th there are obviously differences. It's like one and a half maybe max, yeah. maybe two absolutely max liters per hour. So, so this is where these guidelines are coming from. Nobody was saying drink beyond and above to what you need. The guidelines are, they, they didn't say it in the words, but they meant if you cannot drink close to what you lose, drink as much as you can. Yeah, and first off, before we go any further, I always try to avoid using Alberto Salazar references in the current climate right I know, now. I know, <laughs> but I know. Anyway, I've heard, I've heard that story as well. But my point with going through this, this, these ACS guidelines is really the chronology of things. So if we really wanted to stylize it, in 1996, they're try, you're trying to hydrate per your fluid losses as much as you can tolerate it. If you fast forward 10 or 11 years what starts to emerge is an individualization approach to it. And the, the guideline goes as follows in 2007, because there's considerable variability in sweating rates and sweat electrolyte content between individuals, 
customized fluid replacement programs are recommended. So there's this shift, right, from trying to replace sweat to to let's try to individualize it. And then you fast forward it to 2013, which is the emergence of the drink to thirst guideline, which had all of these other caveats to it, which I always like to read the statement because of all the caveats, because it's like this ping pong match in front of me that I can't really get a fix on where the ping pong ball is going. And so the 2013 statement goes, during exercise, drink according to your thirst, no more and no less. And, and, and finally, they end up with fluid replacement strategy should be individualized and take into consider, consideration environmental conditions, exercise and intensity and duration, pre post body weight, body size and other individual characteristics. So once again, the ping pong matches is drink to your thirst, but individualize it maybe outside of that thirst. And so that's why, so I'm trying to paint the pictures that if you're trying to get a fix on what the actual recommendation is, it's actually hard to pull that apart just from this recommendation. So my question to you is how do athletes do it? Like what's the best mechanism? So um, I think we're barking at the wrong tree, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so one thing that I wanted to clarify, uh, since 2007, ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine, has not um, renew their dietary gu- their uh, position statement for uh, drinking during exercise. So uh, the 2013 was a consortium of scientists that they talk about hyponatremia and ultra exercise, and they came up with a drink to thirst. Um, and there was actually a very early version of that paper, and it got immediately revised, and they had a second version right after. So, so the story, it is indeed very complicated, and there are people with strong opinions, both sides, that they right. strongly believe that what drink to thirst is the best. And there are people on the other side that they strongly believe that drinking to thirst is not good. So the question that we have to ask first, before we answer this question, is what is your outcome? What do you want to achieve? Do you want to complete a race? Or do you want to win a race? Or do you want to go out just for fun? Have a, you know, do a 10K race, do a half marathon. What are you doing? So if we take it completely out of context, then the answer will, it's not easy to give an answer, or you can give an answer that it doesn't apply to all scenarios. Uh, When I talk about anything, actually, when I give any lecture on any topic, uh, I always get the attention of the audience and they pull out their pen and they start taking notes as soon as I give numbers. (laughs) So if I say, so the amount that you're supposed to drink every 10 minutes is... Like everybody yeah, yeah. pays attention and they want to write down that number. What is that magic number? It's like if you if I keep pushing you because you're a coach to tell me what is the best size shoe that I supposed to wear. Tell me, is it nine? Is it eight? Is it ten? Is it eleven? Is it eleven and a half? What is the best size of shoe that I supposed to wear because I want to run this, I don't know, this ultra race? <laughs> you cannot give me an answer. You have, you know. You have to measure my foot, you have to try different types of shoes, and then in the race some people change shoes, in training they wear different size, in the race they may have a little bit wider shoes, I've seen people changing shoes during the race, so you cannot give one one advice to address every single situation. So this is what the most recent advices are. The answer is individualized hydration protocol which is easily said, easily estimated. It doesn't, it's not as easily applied, though. So let me back off a little bit to give you a little bit of, a, um, of an idea of why it is difficult. So you're supposed to drink to address the amount of water that you lose via sweating during exercise. So if you and me do the same, let's say that we have exactly the same running technique, the exact same muscle mass and body mass and percentage of body fat, and we do exactly the same exercise, it doesn't mean we're going to sweat the same. So one of us could sweat way more or way less for doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same intensity. So one of the issues is how much you sweat. And things can get very complicated when you 
find people on the extreme cases, especially when you have what we call the heavy sweaters, people that they sweat profusively. Uh, there are people, I mean, I mentioned earlier, um, runners that they will sweat as much as uh, close to a gallon of water per hour. Um, and, and I'm not taking the examples of a defensive lineman, you know, like a massive person, right. 350 pounds. I'm talking about a, a, a legit runner, somebody who's like 150 pounds, sweating like three liters of sweat per hour. And on the same side, you can have somebody similar fitness sweating half of it. So when you extrapolate that to an event that lasts 15 hours, then the small differences can be extremely complicated to give one advice that will fit both of those extreme cases. 100%. So to make things a little bit more complicated and tying into the, the sodium balance, the, the hyponatremia case, is sodium concentration in sweat, it's also not the same among people. So there are people that they have very, very low sodium concentration down in the 20, 30, 40 milli equivalents per liter of sweat. And we have people that they have very close to 100. Why? We don't know why. Yep. This is how humans behave. So all human beings have that they are not in the, in the intensive care unit. They have almost the same level of sodium in their blood. But in the, their sweat, their sweat, the sodium concentration could vary in a factor of three or four. So when you have somebody sweating 100 milli equivalent per liter and somebody who sweats 20, so the, the first person sweats five times more sodium per hour. If that person happens also to sweat a lot, then you have massive sodium losses. So what advice again do you give? Are you the high sweater and salty sweater, or are you the low sweater with relatively low content of sodium in your sweat? So this is why things are very difficult and very complicated. So let, let's start barking up the right tree then, because I, I'm on board with you that these need to be individualized as much as possible from both the fluid replacement perspective and also the ratio of sodium per unit of fluid that the athlete needs to be ingesting. And there's not going to be a universal answer for everybody. It's not like we can say, okay, everybody just take 20 ounces an hour. And even if we could say, okay, well, take 20 ounces an hour if it's 80 degrees and 30 ounces an hour if it's you know 90 degrees, that still wouldn't be the case. Because then we'd have to individualize it per individual on how much they're sweating and then also on the sodium concentration as well. Can I make it a little bit more complicated? Uh, you go ahead. You can cut, go, go down plus the rabbit your, hole. <laughs> plus your pace. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Plus the terrain. Is it flat or is it is it a climb? Are you climbing yep. over a mountain? Yep. And because you're climbing, your intensity goes up even though you're running the same speed. Yep. So you your, your relative intensity goes up significantly. And the number one determinant of how much you sweat is intensity, how yeah. fast you exercise, you know, are you yeah. standing or are you running? You know? yeah, yeah. And I mean, we, so one of the, one of the exercises that we give our athletes a lot, and we do this at our camps and we have them do, do it at home as well, is just a sweat rate test. And there's strengths and limitations to that, obviously, but it serves as a little bit of an education point, first and foremost. And then also um, like a trial to kind of keep to keep coming back to. And so, so to describe that a little bit is we just have an athlete go out, weigh themselves before a run, go to a run, weigh themselves after the run, and figure out how much body water they lost during that run, whether it's an hour, hour and a half. We try to standardize it to an hour. And then that gives us some sort of target, to your point, Stavros, in those temperature conditions in those terrain conditions and in those intensity conditions. Now, ultra marathon just happens to be a kind of a unique, not, not unique in this case, but the intensity tends to be relatively monotonous for the most part. You could say that the elites do, they can do a higher intensity on the climbs and lower intensity in stents, but once you kind of wash it all out. So that piece of it, actually, I don't think 
gets too complicated in a race situation. It might be different in a training situation. But so let's take this away from the recommendation pieces. One, there's not going to be a universal recommendation for everybody. It's going to be individualized and it's complicated. Before we go down that rabbit hole too much, let's talk about how important it actually is for performance. And that's the tree I want to bark bark up in, in, in context for the rest of this conversation is what are the right hydration or what are, what are the hydration implications of ultramarathon performance? So you have a runner that does the Western States 100 in 28 hours and they want to improve their time to 26 hours. How is hydration a you know component of that? There's been this rule that's that's floated around that a lot of runners are going to be familiar with. And this is the 2% dehydration rule. And it has, just like everything else we've been talking about, kind of come under attack recently. Why don't you give the listeners kind of an, of, of an overview of that and how important even mild dehydration can be on performance? Okay. So uh, the two percent, the two percent came uh, in uh, two thousand seven. Actually, the American College of Sports Medicine, when they recommended the individualized hydration protocol, they shift the focus from uh, drink as much as possible to avoid to replace as much as possible of what you lose to avoid dehydration greater than two percent. So the 2% was taking, based on studies that were published up to 2007, and most of those studies, they use dehydration of 3, 4, or greater percent. So there were, most of the studies were using actually at least 3%. So there was almost an assumption that up to 2 probably doesn't make a big difference. So if you're up to 2, you're probably okay. So it's a guideline to prevent people from over drinking. And, and let me spend just a couple minutes to, to describe what is over drinking. So humans are not programmed to over drink during exercise. Humans are programmed to under drink during exercise. So we don't drink that much and we're okay with that because we don't get thirsty very quickly. And if we drink a little bit, we wet our mouth and we swallow that process kills thirst very quickly. So if you keep drinking a little bit, Thirst goes away, availability of water. Also, you don't have, when you run, you don't have water constantly next to you, you know. Nobody wants to carry, you know, liters of water with them. So so that leads to uh, uh, what it is described in the literature as an involuntary dehydration. So um, some people, however, they thought if drinking a little water is good, drinking a lot of water is better, Drinking way more than a lot of water, it's 10 times better probably. So who really gets um, dehydration and uh, who really gets, I'm sorry, overhydration and hyponatremia are usually people that they go above and beyond what you could ever imagine. So just to give you an idea that one of probably the best studies ever published in in marathon running and, and hyponatremia was done in the Boston Marathon. I think in 2004 by Almond from Harvard, and mm-hmm. it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the, the most prestigious medical journal. They found that the people that they develop severe hyponatremia, they gain in a marathon, listen to this, seven to 12 pounds. Yep. So you finish a race, you finish a marathon, and you gain 10 pounds. You know what is that? I call it not a running race. I call it a drinking race. <laughs> because you also sweat. Yeah. You exercise and you sweat. You spend more time drinking than running a thing. This is like, this is not normal. And, and I'll tell you one thing, which is, which is the main reason that I don't like the argument drinking to thirst. If you ask some of those people that they develop hyponatremia, you know what they say? If you I'm ask thirsty. them why were you drinking, I was yeah. very thirsty. Thirsty, yep. So you could be thirsty and develop hyponatremia. The more you drink, your mouth dries up faster, yeah. and you start feeling that you need to drink more water. 
So we have people that they develop hyponatremia and they say thirsty. So why would I go out and say drink to thirst that you could also develop hyponatremia, (laughs) which is hyponatremia. It's a terrible thing to happen. You know, it it doesn't happen very often, to be quite honest, to the extent that would be very dangerous and lethal. There are not as many people dying from hyponatremia. Most people die from complications of heat stroke and dehydration. Right. But but it is a very, very dangerous situation and we don't definitely we don't want people to become hyponatremic. So so this is where the two percent comes from, the two percent, in an effort to avoid all these people thinking of, you know, let's drink as much as I can, let's go crazy with it, and if one is good, ten would be better and one hundred would be one hundred times more. Um, so, um, uh, 2% it's something that probably, unless the intensity is very high and unless the heat is not, it, it, the, the heat is not very high, you might have a, a very small decrement in exercise performance. Um, I would be happy to go and, and explain to you some of very interesting work that we have done over the years. I don't know if you wanted to comment yeah. for whatever I said so no, far. No, so I want to get back to, first off, this 2% rule, it's not like a hard line. I think that's one thing Correct. For, for people to understand. You're above the line and you're good. You're below the line and you're not good. The second thing is, is that, yes, even small amounts of dehydration can impact your performance. And I think this is where you're going at with some of the studies that, that you're Correct. referencing. Let's let's go through that and, and probably start with what are like the practical levels of this quote unquote mild dehydration that you put your that you put the subjects through and then what are the like the practical outcomes of those? So so um, we made up the definition of what is mild dehydration. We said if you sub to avoid dehydration greater than 2%, then anything below 2%, I would call it mild dehydration. So this is how we define mild dehydration. So anything at least 1%, but less than 2%. So that threshold of very, very small amount of water loss. So um, ourselves and several other people have done series of studies Uh, And we have found that even a small degree of dehydration, like minus 1% of dehydration, could have a detrimental effect on exercise performance. Most of those studies are done in cycling performance. Uh, We have done studies in a laboratory, and we have also done studies outdoors. We did a study a few years ago, actually, where we took cyclists, and I use cyclists specifically because cyclists are obsessed with uh, power to weight ratio, especially when you when you have climbers and they to Tour de France and they climb mountains, etc. So the idea is, if I start a little bit dehydrated, so if I lose one or two kilos before, so I'm like one two percent maybe down, then if I can produce the same amount of power which is a big, big assumption, Mm -hmm. then per kilogram of body weight going uphill in the mountain, I should be able to produce more power per kilogram of body weight because I have less water in my engine. Yep. This is the Team Sky Chris Froome nonsense that you're referring to. (laughs) So Chris Froome never said that. I'll call it nonsense. You can call it nonsense if you Uh, want to. Chris Froome never said that. There are a lot of uh, things in the media about that like chris Froome was doing low carb diet i don't know chris Froome was chris Froome was eating carbs like crazy last year when he when he did this crazy um uh attack in in giro d'italia and he won with a solo attack of 80 kilometers before the end of the stage anyway but anyway <laughs> what, what i'm trying to say so the first study was done by an australian group and and they create a water deficit and they they make cyclists run race on a treadmill on on a massive treadmill on a big grade and they found that yes you lose weight but you cannot produce the same amount of power output so not only you don't go faster you go slower so some scientists have suggested that this thing is because you do studies indoors and when you do it outdoors it's different etc so 
we, we did a study with, with um, highly competitive uh, cyclists, and we did that study actually in Athens in Greece, and we went to a mountain which is right outside of Athens, and we took a, a specific route, which is a race route. So there is a classic climb time trial race in Athens, and every cyclist who lives around Athens, they do that for practice like very often. So it's something that, you know, it's a challenge. You want to do something tough, go climb that mountain and see how fast you can do it. So we did that under two occasions. One, when they were well hydrated, what we call U-hydrated condition, and another time when we induce a minus 1% dehydration. And we found that even 1% of dehydration, which is literally one and a half pound of body weight loss for those skinny cyclists, uh, it decreased their, ex their performance. They did, their, the route was approximately six or seven kilometers. They, uh, they completed the race by approximately close to one minute slower, even though they were lighter. And this is the interesting part. Even though they were going slower, their body temperature was higher. Right. So they were going slower, and they were hotter, and the water deficit was minimal. So I know you asked me the question, what would be the implication for an ultra? Yeah. The honest answer that I should give is I do not know because I don't, I'm not aware of anybody who has done any studies of, of that nature during ultra marathon. We do not know. However, I assume if I had to guess uh, that you should have some sort of an effect. In ultra, things get very complicated, and they're very difficult to really assess such right. a small, small differences. Yeah. Well, if, if we're theorizing a little bit on that, from one standpoint, you could say that the thermal stress on the ultra runner is higher because the speed is lower and they've been exercising for longer. So therefore, the dehydration would have a bigger impact. But on the other hand, because the intensity is lower... Maybe it's the actual opposite. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, and I, I appreciate the answer. I don't know, and because it is a, it's a hard condition to study. <laughs> this is the truth. I mean, uh, the lower intensity might be a little bit forgiven, right? Because your 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 cardiovascular demand, it is not as um, excessive. So your heart rate, you are not. I mean, those cyclists that they were climbing the mountains, their heart rate was like over 90% of their max. So they yep. were going heart rates like 180 something yep. mean, which is nothing that you would ever experience during an ultra. Yep. But I also think we'd be remiss not to mention though, the the training analog between the cyclist time trial that you're, that you're describing and the training analog as it pertains to ultra running is the same. I mean, a lot of times they're going to be training at that exact same intensity. And if anything, I honestly, this is my observational input from coaching a lot of athletes is they put more athletes tend to put more of a focus on their nutrition and hydration and race conditions as compared to training conditions. And I think that those two should be equal because what you're trying to do in training is you're trying to optimize the output. You're trying to optimize the power output in cycling. You're trying to optimize the pace output and in, in, in running in order to create a super compensation effect. And if you can use proper hydration to do that, you should absolutely use that tool when in a lot of cases you can get away with it. In a two hour run in 60 degree temperature, a lot of runners will just go out without anything. And that's not what they should be doing in order to optimize their training for that day. Absolutely. You're right. We tend to forget that. Then we remember everything right before the race. Uh, <laughs> you, you, cannot, you cannot imagine how many people send me emails Hey, I'm running this marathon tomorrow. What should I drink? You know? like, I get really? those e I get those emails from a training perspective. I'm doing this ultra marathon tomorrow. What should I do? I'm like, just go have run. fun at this point. Yeah, just go run. run. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, needless to say, there's a performance implication even with small amounts of dehydration, one to two percent, and even greater than that. Is it linear? Is it exponential? Like, what are the consequences of greater than 2%? Uh, greater than 2%, I think, uh, especially when you reach the level of 3 to 4%, then the detrimental is really, really obvious. And you have implications to other things that you don't see in the mild percent of dehydration. You have 
um, effects on strength, you have effects on balance, you have effects on cognition. Cognition actually, it's something that, uh, and mood is something that changes even from mild percent of dehydration. And for some reason, the data show that women seems to be more sensitive on, uh, on mood effects. So th their mood changes uh, a little bit faster with mild dehydration in women versus in men. At, at least this is what the, the data that we have right now in the literature um, indicate. Uh, what, is, what is really interesting with, uh, with dehydration, because this is something that some people have been all the way to the other extreme and saying, you know, don't worry about dehydration, your body will figure it out. And even if you lose four, five, six percent, you're okay as long as you're outdoors and drink whenever you feel like. Um, and, and I think where, where these people were coming from, uh, they were thinking that most of the studies that have been published in, in scientific laboratories, they're limited by nature by two things. Number one, it's very, very difficult to mask drinking. So if you come into my lab and you are one of my volunteers and you do a study, it's very hard to fake whether you're drinking or not. So you know you're drinking and you know when you're not drinking. Mm -hmm. So when you know that today we're doing this experiment that you're not going to be drinking anything, psychologically you might be predisposed of, you know, today it's going to suck and I'm not going to perform as well as I could just because I'm not drinking anything. So what is called the, the predisposition or the expectation of low performance because um, I have a handicap today. The second part is that when you exercise and you get thirsty because you're not drinking and you get mouth dryness, you develop so many negative cues that it makes you feel bad and you underperform not because dehydration is bad for you, because you have those negative cues per se. So the thirst that goes away if you drink on your own and you have even a little bit of access to water. So, so this is a legitimate concern that we took very serious, and we did this study actually that we published in 2018. We took athletes and we put nasal gastric tubes. So instead of them drinking, in one of the experiments, we will push fluids directly into their stomach, and on the other condition, we would not push anything. We will pretend that we were doing the same thing. So we had connected the tubes behind them, and, and the tube was connected to a, uh, a pump, one of those pumps that we have in hospitals for intravenous infusion of fluids. So we will plan, we will um, uh, infuse plain warm water, actually. We even infuse the water in body temperature so they would not feel the temperature going in. So we were super, super careful. So we were able to blind them. We even measure stomach fullness, whether they could get any cues from their stomach of being full or anything, and they had no, absolute no idea what the experiment they were doing. The second thing we did, we make them drink just uh, two thirds of an ounce of water every five minutes. So just enough, which is like a big sip of water, just enough to wet their mouth and swallow. That act of rinsing your mouth and swallowing that activates some receptors in, in the back of your mouth that kills thirst. So, so we induced the situation where people were blinded, they didn't know whether they were drinking or not, and they were not thirsty. So we were able to induce dehydration during exercise, in one case, that they were not thirsty and they didn't know whether they were drinking or not. And on the other side, we were euhydrated by infusing a lot of water into their stomach and also drinking that very small uh, sip of water every five minutes just to kill thirst. So even under this scenario, we found that exercise performance uh, decrement is present. So even if you don't know about it, even if you're not thirsty, your body knows. Your body knows and you're dehydrated. And because you're dehydrated, your exercise performance declines. And the explanation is simple. When you get dehydrated, even a small amount of dehydration, unfortunately, you lose significant amount of water from your blood. So your blood gets thicker. And as a response, because you have less blood, your heart has to work harder to maintain oxygen supply. 
So that stress in the cardiovascular system seems to be one of the first and most important implication that leads to decrement in exercise performance. And also all the signals also, um, um, as a response, they create a condition where it's more difficult to dissipate heat. So one of the things that happen when you get dehydrated, less blood goes to your skin, so less heat gets transferred from the muscles to the skin to the environment. So what we see over and over and over in every dehydration study, two things. One, we see higher cardiovascular stress, so your heart rate beats faster, your cardiovascular system gets stress, and number two, we see your body temperature being higher. And what is funny, we find higher body temperature, but with lower sweat rate. So you end up sweating yeah. less with higher body temperature. So your thermoregulatory system gets compromised. That study that you just went over, I remember when it came out, I, I thought it was a just a really brilliant and elegant way to do it. I would not have volunteered for that study, by the way. You got some hearty volunteers from the way that you described it, I'm sure. <laughs> We did the data collection in Arkansas. We ended up recruiting people all the way to Missouri and Kansas. Oof. Oh, man. We, were, we went to every bike team, every bike shop. We begged people to the extent that a year after, we were doing a different study, and we had to advertise any other study that we don't use nasal gastric tubes. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody was like, are you going to put tubes through my nose, I, down to my stomach? I'm like, no, 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 no. We're well, like, like everybody else, when I read that, I'm like, oh, this is a really cool way to do it. And then I started reading through the methods, and I'm like, oh, I would never sign up for this. <laughs> Jason, we did, we did a lot of cool stuff, actually, in this study. Other than the tube and all that stuff, we end up, we paid the subjects to participate, and we also pay all the subjects based on their performance outcome every time they were doing the performance element of the of the study. So at the end of the protocol was a very high intensity um, performance element, and we create a ranking of twenty different levels, from three hundred dollars all the way down to twenty dollars. So when you were doing the performance and you had the nose, the heat sensors inside, the skin sensors. IV lines and on and on and on. You were hooked up, you know, and you were dying because you were doing very hard exercise. We said, now you have to try as hard as you can and you have a chance to make another $150 in the next 10 minutes or 200 So even if you knew that Jason is also competing, who is very be way better than me, maybe I won't make the $300. Maybe I'll make the $250 or the 200 or the 150 or the 125 or the 100 or the same. <laughs> Still so no thank we you. we <laughs> really, really tried to make it work. We, yeah. we really, really tried to make it as, to eliminate other factors that could influence right. exercise performance as much as possible. And you have to do that because as you know, being a researcher, and there's always gonna be holes in studies. And whenever one gets put out, somebody's gonna say, oh, well, listen, this didn't happen or this condition wasn't you know, standardized for or you didn't control for this variable. And that's part of science is you gradually kind of move the needle and you control for different variables and things like this. I think that that one in terms of controlling for the act of drinking, right? Wetting your mouth down and blinding the, blinding the subjects to being able to drink it was Is there any other plausible way to do that besides the way that you guys set it up? Uh, we've done other studies with uh, intravenous infusion. So yeah. we infuse water directly, not water, actually saline. Yeah. You cannot infuse intravenous water. I mean, you will kill right. people if Die. you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so we've done studies with intravenous infusion, um, and we've done with mild dehydration and intravenous infusion. Um Otherwise, you're Still, drinking, you know, whether you're yeah. drinking or not. There are other yeah. studies that they have done drinking with diuretics, but then when you pee every 10 minutes, like, you know, right. like if you pee, like, you know, nonstop, <laughs> you know that you took yeah. diuretic. So yeah. it's, it's, I won't tell you, but it's not hard to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the sodium equation or the sodium side of this equation, because you really can't, in a performance context, you can't talk about taking in fluid without also taking in some sodium on board. Um, and 
the recommendations here, similar to the hydration recommendations, kind of go all over the map. There was a recent uh, ISSN position paper on on, on ultra marathons, which kind of which kind of pegged the sodium in this range of three. I should have looked this up beforehand, but three hundred to 600 milligrams of sodium per liter of fluid. And while you're going over why that's relevant, I'm gonna get that number specifically. But my point is, is the range is usually, the range whenever it's presented is usually double from the low end of the range to the high end of the range, which starts to speak to your individualization nature of how much sodium is contained in sweat. Why is it important though? Why is it important to just to not just drink, to also have sodium be contained in what an athlete is consuming while they're you know while they're trying to perform? So, um, so sodium has uh, gotten very bad uh, reputation. First of all, so let's start by that because uh, it is very clear in the literature that for uh, at population level. People that they consume high amount of sodium, they tend to have higher blood pressure, lower bone quality, and and consuming a lot of sodium, it's not a healthy behavior. So if you ask any random human being and say, if you had to improve your diet, what would you do? So they will come up with the simple things, I don't know, maybe lower sugar, lower fat, maybe. Probably the third thing they're going to say, it's going to be eat less salt. Right. So there is the overall perception that salt is bad. The next one is um, it, the, the important thing of this recommendation is that this is designed for people that are not athletes. And definitely it is not designed for ultra marathoners. <laughs> so unfortunately, that message hasn't been disseminated widely. So people don't know that they, uh, they should drink way more than uh, the recommendation for inactive people. So just to give you one idea, uh, there was a study published uh, um, looking at it back in 2010 by Ron Mon, where he measured uh, soccer t- players in Europe. Um, and he was measuring sodium losses in a 90-minute soccer training. So he found that the amount of sodium that they were losing, it was between 600 milligrams to 3,100 milligrams. So the range, again, is is massive range. It could be like from half a gram to three grams. So six folds difference from one side to the other. Uh, But this is excessive amount of sodium loss. So if you give to these people consistently, what are the dietary guidelines, which is like a lesson of what they lose during a, a soccer practice, these people progressively, they will end up going on the on a negative sodium balance so so definitely this is not something that you can do and and this is not healthy for them and i have seen it from practice over and over with with many different people that they have all sorts of symptoms and complaints etc and and all those complaints can go away just by adding a little salt in their diet Uh, i mean i can tell you stories like one after the other we did um, another study with, uh, I don't know if we will qualify as ultra. It was uh, uh, over a marathon. It was uh, That qualifies. K Come qualifies, on. 50K right? is an ultra marathon. We're not okay. pretentious about that stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, 50K race in, uh, in, in a trail, and it was actually the Olympus Marathon, again in Greece. Uh, and, and it's a very tough one because it starts from sea level and it goes all the way up to 10,000 feet altitude and then you finish back down to sea level. So lots of climb and, and difficult terrain. And, and you, you run the entire Olympus Marathon actually from the base all the way to the top. Um, and uh, we were doing a study there actually that was published uh, a few months ago. And we were also looking for hyponatremia. And I remember at the end of the race, this guy comes to me because he knew that I was running that study. And he was like, can you help me? I was like, I am getting cramps. I was getting, in, I get cramps all the time. In this race, I had to stop and rest and stretch and eat, etc. I was getting cramps everywhere. So I'm talking to this guy 
and I'm looking at him and the salt deposition on his face, he was like unsaved for a couple of days, probably. It was like salt scales on his, <laughs> on his face. I end up asking him permission to take a picture. I'm like, can I take a picture of your face? <laughs> I have pictures of people with, you know, massive salt stains. I use them for presentations. I have published one of those pictures actually in a, in a book chapter a few years ago. But so I, I start asking the, the classic questions and the classic questions are, are those, do you live alone or do you live with somebody who's hypertensive? I'm like, I live with my dad and my dad is hypertensive. Do you do low salt diet? Like, absolutely. We don't buy salt in the house at all. <laughs> wow. And I started laughing and I'm like, what do you laugh? I'm like, it's good for your dad probably. Yeah. But for you, you need salt. Like you're sweating, you lose a lot of salt. So what I'm trying to say, the take home message is that salt has, for a good reason, has gotten very bad reputation. There is uh, sodium um, uh, sensitivity and, and hypertension associated to high sodium intake. But for an ultra athlete, high sodium diet is very good for you. It's something that you need. So it's, I've seen things going from one side to the other. I've been yeah. to races and, and give talks before Walter races and talking about the importance of taking sodium. And then I've seen halfway through the race, I have seen people taking a glass with very little water, pouring maybe an inch of salt on the water, <laughs> stirring it with their finger and chugging it. The whole thing, I was like, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> you need more sodium. Well, it, it, there was a, there was one point where sodium was pushed copiously on ultramarathon athletes to where they would recommend you know over a, a gram or even two an hour. And for the life of me, I've never understood why why those recommendations had ever come out in terms of per unit time. But to drive it back to the recommendation is just as a little bit of a clarification. I did just look up the the ISSN statement. It's 500 to 700 milligrams of sodium per liter of fluid, and that's sodium coming from all sources. So sodium in your drink, sodium in your food, sodium in your gels, and things like that. Your story of the of the salty sweater is one that a lot of ultra runners are going to identify with. Is would that be a reasonable tool? to dial in that record, that individualized recommendation. Like if I go out on a run and I don't have the salty scales on my, uh, you know, face. on my, on my face everywhere, I'm not going to be one of the people that you take a picture of. I can be towards the lower end of that recommendation. The, your salty scaly friend might be on the higher or even over that recommendation. Is that a reasonable way to even think about it? I think it makes sense. Um, it's, it's not scientific, but you know how in hydration you say, take a look of how often you go to the bathroom and how dark is your urine? That would be, take a look at your clothes. Do you get massive salt stains when you exercise for a relatively short period of time? If yes, this is a sign that you're losing way too much sodium. So, so this is a, a, a ballpark estimation. If you want to be scientific, you know, collect sweat, measure the concentration and be very scientific. Um, I've, I've measured hundreds, if not thousands of people over the years. And, and unfortunately, the range, it's absolutely crazy. There was a, there, there are multiple studies. There was a study published a few years ago from the Gatorade Sports Science Institute because they do a lot of sweat testing with athletes that they sponsor. And they collect all this data and they had hundreds and hundreds of athletes and they had, you know, ranges. Uh, there was another study that just published recently in people with uh, muscle cramping history and looking at sodium losses from sweat. It, it was just published a few days ago by Kevin Miller, Susan Jurgen, and Brandon McDermott, I believe. Um, so... so there is again this large range and if you don't have access to a, a lab laboratory based assessment that's a, a an easy way to say the massive salt stains is an indication that you're losing a lot but you do need so let's just like get the obvious stuff out of the way okay in yes. an ultra marathon situation you do need sodium 
that is coming from that can't or I get that can come from a multitude of sources in the sports drink from food from salt you know putting from salt in somewhere. water and stirring it from 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 somewhere from somewhere because the losses are so long so big that it's it is really matter of time yeah. uh, that you will develop hyponatremia it's math so if you keep drinking only water and you keep losing sodium and you don't replace that sodium loss it's a matter of time when hyponatremia will develop. And it's a factor of how much you sweat, how concentrated is the sodium in your sweat, and how long is the race. So if you're a salty sweater and high sweater, and you exercise in a long race, like Spartathlon is a good example for hyponatremia because it's like mean finishing time of our volunteers was 30 hours. So you will develop it unless you take some some sodium intake through your diet, whether it is a peel or whether it is a salty cracker, whether there is something. But you lose way more than you think you do. And mm -hmm. and um, it's drinking salty drinks during exercise is not very pleasant, to be quite <laughs> honest. Well, um, and they've tried to mask it recently, right, with just the flavor profiles. I actually think that the the higher quality commercial sports drinks. So the scratch labs, the fluids, Cliff has one that's quite, uh, that's quite good. Osmo has one that's quite good. They generally do a pretty good job of balancing the flavor profile and the sodium content as well as the energy content because they know that it works. Yeah. And, and those are stuff that you should try. And one thing which yeah. is very important in ultra, probably the, the single most important determinant of whether you're going to finish or not, I think, uh, an ultra race is whether you can maintain good gut health during the yeah. race. Uh, if something happened in your GI system and you have vomiting and diarrhea and you cannot eat food, you cannot finish the race. It's over. If you cannot address, if you cannot have a healthy gut during the race, you're not finishing the race uh especially races that there are you know multiple hours uh, yeah. you need you cannot sustain energy supply with what you started with you, you have to take it you have absolutely 100 percent. i mean that and that's so, and and that's what uh uh that, that the author of the issn position paper that we were just re referencing he was on an earlier podcast nick tiller that was one of the things that he kept emphasizing is that if you can't take in calories your day is going to go away that's the single most important thing to, to 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 keep in mind with any of this stuff so sodium intake for all the ultra i think in my opinion it is necessary uh, if your exercise duration is up to three hours, you can get around with just drinking um, water. You know, you don't really need electrolytes when the duration is. And, and if you uh, read more specifically the 2007 position statement from the American College of Sports Medicine, it says this is for a prolonged period of exercise. This is when you really need the sodium and even carbohydrates. If the exercise duration is up to one hour of high intensity or um, even longer with lower intensity, you could probably get around without even carbohydrates. But yeah. for the long events, uh, taking electrolytes um, and, and obviously calories and carbs, yeah. it's, it's necessary to be able to sustain energy production. There, there's been a movement in the ultra world over the last uh, few years away in, if, with regards to sodium moving away from the pills, the S caps and things like that, and towards sodium sources that are either contained within the drink or contained within foodstuffs. And a, a lot of that rationale is based around the dump of sodium that you're getting all at one time with those pills. How, like, how valid is that? Or should that still be taking in those pills with that big sodium dump? Should that still be part, part of the strategy? So the, the concept is, the, the, the idea against it is if you put a massive amount of sodium at the same time in the stomach, you put a massive osmotic load. So you keep something which is very concentrated in, in your stomach. So when whatever you eat gets liquidified and it's very highly osmotic, so very hypertonic, it takes longer to be absorbed. 
So you, you give a little bit of a shock in your stomach and your GI system, when you run this kind of races, it's already sensitive. So you're in the border trying to maintain gut health and finish the race. We know that most of the ultra runners, by the end of the race, they develop some sort of, um, especially running, they have, most of them, they have a micro GI bleeding. Um, this is uh, very evident. The mechanical um, torturing, I would call it, you know, the, the, I mean, <laughs> yeah. running for mechanical so many stress, hours, yeah. the mechanical yeah. damage by itself from yeah. the vibrations of yeah. running, um, it's contributing to this kind of issue. Um, we have done studies with um, looking at GI distress, and we were measuring specifically, we were collecting stool samples after the race, measuring hemoglobin concentration from uh, runners versus cyclists, for example. So we will have cyclists in 40 degrees plus C, like over 102 degrees Celsius, uh, sorry, Fahrenheit, and they will have no, no hemoglobin whatsoever. Right. And you, you look at runners that they do the equivalent uh, running and you have like incidents of like 80%. Yeah. So, so GI system is very stressed overall. So it's a good idea not to shock your GI system by giving a massive amount at the same time. Or if you take some pills, just pace them. Don't take too many together. So that's the concept, trying to give something which is not too concentrated so yeah. your body can absorb easily fluids um, yeah, and everything and else. And that's why from a practical recommendation standpoint, we tend to try to drive a lot of the sodium needs through the fluid because then they're getting it in that constant drip and it doesn't create that osmotic load in the stomach. Plus it probably tastes better. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and palatability is very important <laughs> yep. uh, when people drink. Um, so so it's a, palatability can drive fluid intake as well, trying to maintain good hydration during the race. Yep. Okay, so we talked about even very mild. I'm going to expand upon your mild definition between 2% and 0% to be very, very mild, 1% or even less that amount of dehydration is going to impact performance. We know that sodium needs to be consumed in conjunction with water in order to maintain the right electrolyte balance. But is weight loss inevitable as a result of dehydration or water loss? Is weight loss inevitable in an ultra marathon situation given it's so long, so many calories need to be processed you're mobilizing fat stores, you're mobilizing carbohydrate stores. How much can we extrapolate this one to 2% weight loss de de declining performance in any other situation? How much can we extrapolate that into ultra or is some amount of weight loss tolerable? This is a, a very good question and I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> Um, and I'll tell you where, we're, where I think the root of your question is that in laboratory settings, we use change in body weight as the definition of dehydration. So we bring uh, somebody in the lab, we take their body weight, uh, we measure that they're 150 pounds, we put them on the treadmill, they run for, the, for an hour, they lose four pounds, and you said you're minus four pounds uh, dehydrated, which is, let's say, 2%, roughly, 2% um, uh, dehydration. So when you go in prolonged type of exercise that could be multiple hours, you don't have only water loss. You also have you know, nutrients that you lose plus things that you eat. And occasionally in some cases, you might even have bowel movement during a race. So all these things could play a role. So the, the calculation change in body weight equal change on hydration status, it, it is not perfect uh, when you're looking into um, endurance races. And and it has to be, I mean, obviously it can be calculated, but it becomes so complicated even right. for scientists that it's, uh, I would say, impractical. What I would recommend, I would say overall, um, up to 1% of dehydration probably. And again, is it a six hours ultra? Is it a 26 hours ultra? That could make um, a difference. Um, that would be something that I would consider. You're probably okay. The 1%, I think it's fine. Uh, having a scale, and I know uh, 
athletes have support groups, etc., and measuring your body weight during the race, the value of taking your body weight during a race is, is tremendous. I think it can give you a very good idea how you're doing. Um, we have people, I mean, we have a lot of data from, from the Spartathlon race, which is difficult to keep control of what you're doing in so many hours and people get exhausted. They're, they're hot, they're hypoglycemic, they're hyponatremic, they're exhausted, physically emotional. Uh, they're athletes that are like delusional at the end of the race. They don't know where they are. I remember some years ago, there was this Japanese uh, ultra guy who finished in Sparta, you know, in the finishing line. It's so emotional and everything. And the guy had no idea where he was. <laughs> I bet anything, he would not remember anything from, from the, at least from him finishing yeah. the race. I've and been there. Like, this is such a shame. You know, you did it. You, yeah. you did the race. Yeah. He was out completely. Yeah. So how would you expect that person to have a good perception of how thirsty this person is or how well hydrated this person is? So having a scale, you can get a very good idea approximately where you are. Um, ultra race fluid balance. It's the most complicated case uh, to, to really monitor. Yeah. And but when from you start a... seeing minus two, minus three percent of your body weight, then within the margin of error that you do have, because it's not a perfect tool, it gives you a very good advice whether you should pick up the game or if you start seeing that you're gaining weight, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. You know, slow down your drinking. You don't have to do that much. So some so some weight loss, I, I think we can kind of stylize this, is some weight loss, one to three percent or so, in an ultra situation, obviously, depending upon the length of it, would be would be tolerable and probably wouldn't result in any sort of uh, performance decline. But I also think the other thing that especially the medical professionals are really wary of is they don't want the athletes to gain weight. Because Absolutely. of the medical, because of the medical risks associated with over being overhydrated and hyponatremic at the same time, and that's where we come into the weight recommendations as this well. This is absolutely right. So you should pay attention. You by any means you should not be gaining weight during a race. And and I think the data from Boston Marathon, I think, are some of the best data that we have. And they had hundreds of subjects that they were running the race. If I remember correct, they had about five six hundred runners. And, and they indicated they once that they were developing hyponatremia, they were gaining um, 7 to 12 pounds in a marathon race, which is mind-blowing, over 5 kilos. In, that in, would be hard to do if you tried. Absolutely. I remember seeing that I, and going, I, like, that's, I, that's an event in itself. <laughs> I, I've, I've done the math. Um and, and I was trying to figure out, like, how much does it take? So, uh, I, I mean, I'm so do, I gain, do it in my head. It's so, a little so, bit over a pint every two miles. So, so you're supposed to drink uh, to gain the, the that limit in kilos is three to five kilos in a in a marathon race. So, in 26 miles, right? So, you have to drink 700 to 1200 ml above what you lose by sweating or urinating right, right. every 10K. Right. Every 10K, you need to have almost a liter above to what you naturally, your body's going to lose anyway. I know. So, 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 it's there, <laughs> so is that reasonable? No. Yeah, you have to try to screw that up. You have to. You have to. That, that's my argument. So that's exactly my argument. This is it becomes a drinking race. I call it not a yeah. running race. Yeah, don't do that. Don't. Absolutely you will for not. sure end up in Stavros's medical tent very early in Spartathlon if you undertake that strategy. <laughs> you will not be finishing Spartathlon with that strategy. No, no chance. No, these people are very experienced. We didn't have anybody, I think, that gained so much weight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, we're going to let you go. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate the little bit of baiting that you uh, that you had to put up with me with the ACSM statements and whatnot, but it makes it interesting, right? Because it is, as you mentioned, no, no, it's, it's confounding. Yeah. It, um, it is difficult, and I think it's difficult. 
I don't think anybody has an intention to hurt anyone. Uh, nobody's going to gain, you know, anything by drinking more water. You know, nobody sells water. You know, we don't have, uh, I, I don't have stock in, uh, in the local <laughs> Phoenix water company or anything, you know, um, the, I think the intention behind those guidelines when they came out in 96, uh, drink as much that got very, very heavily scrutinized. It was the intention addressing people that they could not drink much at all. And back in the nineties, most people will not drink anything whatsoever. They will just do the race and don't even bother at all. Like use the sponge and put some water in the head, you know, maybe a little bit on your lips and, and, and that's it and drink very little. Yep. So, so the thing, this is the mindset and, yep. um, the, the, the more you drink, the better it is. It's something that some athletes, you know, the paradigm, you know, and, and it goes with everything with nutritional supplements. Somebody says you have to take, I don't know, creatinine. Um, I was in an ACSM conference a few years ago and we had this, uh, uh, professor from uh, University of Massachusetts, her name was Priscilla Clarkson. She passed away a few years ago. One of, of the most distinct professors in muscle physiology in America. And she was presenting data from a bodybuilder who was taking for more than six months, 80 grams of creatine as a supplement per day. Like wow. the, the dietary guide, the, the guidelines for creatinine as a supplement right now is around two to five grams per day. Yeah. Some of the older protocols were 20 grams per day. This guy was taking 80 grams for six months. He developed this muscle issue. They had to take him to the hospital. But the only reason I'm bringing it up is if if five is good, 25 is five, as, five times as good, <laughs> and 80 is probably 20 times as good. You know what I'm saying? So it's that mentality sometimes that if one time is good, multiple times is better. And, and I think this is, has, this is what has driven the uh, over drinking sometimes in some races. And ultra runners are notorious for taking that advice to a T. If five miles is good, 10 miles is twice as good, 20 miles is twice as good as that, and 40 miles is twice as good as that, so I'm just gonna do the the, the maximum tolerable dose, right, is, is what gets put in the literature every once in a while. So we would be good, we as a community, as, a, as an ultra running community, would always be well served to to realize that there's some reasonableness that we need to apply with any sort of recommendations and more is not always better. Absolutely. All right. Where can people learn more about you and the research that you do? Um, I have a Twitter account that I post things that we do in the lab and things around hydration. And it's uh, my Twitter handle is Dr. Hydration and DR hydration, so one word. And I also have a Twitter lab uh, page that we put stuff more related to hydration science per se, which is uh, hydration sci, S-C-I. Awesome. awesome, you have an awesome Twitter handle, by the way. I'm envious of that. <laughs> you got Dr. Hydration. I'm glad you nabbed that really early on. Thanks what you do. We'll have uh, links to all that stuff in the show notes for the people that are listening. and. Keep what, doing what you're doing, Stavros. It's awesome work. There we go. There you have it. That was fun. This whole thing with hydration has always been so confounding to me. And I can remember at several points of my career as we went through uh, during the podcast of where these different recommendations come out to drink as much as you can, to offset uh, any sort of body water loss, drink to thirst. And I really think that we found the right solution now where we're trying to, as much as possible, come to customized individual hydration plans for each and every single athlete. But that takes a lot of work. It's a lot more work to go out there and figure out what your sweat rate is in different conditions under different intensities, as opposed to just saying, no, I'm just going to take in a liter an hour all the time. I realize it's a lot of work, but 
it's worth it in the long run. And as we went through during the podcast, there are real absolute performance uh, implications for this that can either happen during the race or during training. And you want to perform at your best during training as well. Those, The way that you perform in training absolutely has an impact on how much you can improve and then therefore will have an impact on whatever race or event you are training for. Hope everybody found this podcast insightful. If you have not had the chance, go ahead and head on over to iTunes and give the podcast a rating or a review. Helps the podcast out a lot. Appreciate the heck out of everybody listening and we will see you all out on the trails.